Well, well, thank you very much for being here on a Friday in which there are a number of strikes, in which I also heard that there is the possibility of having a terrorist attack. So, I mean, to say that uh, that it is a complicated Friday is, uh, is, is really an understatement, but I'm very pleased to welcome you, and I'm especially pleased to welcome our uh, I mean, the person we've invited, who is Ferenc Ocher, I should say, who comes to us from Budapest and who is a professor of political science and philosophy. He's director of the Research Institute of Politics and Government, and he's also a senior researcher at the Institute of Philosophy of the Hungarian Academy of Science. I have to say that I met him 17 years ago, so it's quite a long time, even if he had forgotten. <laughs> no, no, I, I, you remember that then it came back, it, it all came back. <laughs> so his research interests include conservatism and liberalism, and that's why we were very pleased that he accepted to come to this research seminar. He's worked a lot on the history of early modern political thought, classical Hungarian political thought, early modern and contemporary philosophy of art, which is also very important for the reference to that subject. He's the author, most recently, of uh, Art and Politics in Roger Scruton's Conservative Philosophy, which was published with Borgrave. I should have the book, but I haven't. It's going to arrive tomorrow, which is very impractical, unpractical, and uh, impractical, sorry. And But at the same time, I have to mention, for those of you who work on conservatism, that one of his latest books was on uh, conservative philosophy and was widely reviewed, especially in La Revue Française et Civilisation Mythique. So today he is accepted to come and talk about the notion of society and the individual in British conservative thought. And he's going to be talking about Roger Scruton and his forerunners. And so we are carrying on with the theme which we started a month ago. And you're going to say that we are focusing very much on Britain, which is true, but uh, next time will be a, a bit different. But I mean, uh, um, I mean, as you will see, uh, Ferenc has got this wide knowledge and especially understanding of Roger Scruton uh, in European uh, sort. And so, uh, Ferenc, the floor is yours for 40, 45 minutes. Thank you very much, Kathleen. And uh, thank you for all of you to be here and interested in, in my talk. I'm also interested in, in your uh, comments and questions. I think it's, it's very uh, much of an honor to be uh, here and also to to you know talk about uh, my my own work, uh, which is of course important for me, but not necessarily important for you. But I hope that it will be, and I hope it will come out by the end of the discussion. Why? So uh, yes, uh, it was uh, this year released my book Art and Politics in Roger Scruton's Conservative Philosophy, and. Uh, and the reason why I wrote it that uh, the, uh, the person who was a British uh, political philosopher died in 2020, and I knew him for some time. He was born in 44 and died in 2020. So uh, uh, he was, I think, one of the most important analytical philosophers of his age in the fields that he researched on, which was uh, political philosophy, and aesthetics, the philosophy of art, the two things that I try to address in, in that uh, book. But today, uh, the kind invitation was to talk about his views on uh, the individual and the community, which is the topic uh, of your uh, series. And that's a topic which is quite uh, crucial for, for a conservative philosopher for uh, different reasons, and I try to explain why and I try to present some of his ideas, and I'm happy to discuss more uh, in the questions and comments part. But maybe we can start with this uh, this picture that I, I used here. And uh, Catherine asked me just uh, uh, quite uh, 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 interestedly why I have chosen this uh, this uh, picture for for this uh, talk, and I I would be happy to hear what you think about that why i have i might have chosen this what 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 is your first thought that that uh, to have a talk on someone's uh, views on the individual and the society we use uh, this uh, sort of a picture about his family well i did not mention it this is the person on the, on the left and and his family 
in, uh, including uh, his wife on the right and uh, the two children. Yes, please. Society does not exist at all that our families said they are engaged. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least uh, most societies have families, I should put it this way. So in a way, uh, it, it points uh, towards that uh, uh, part of uh, our society. But we can perhaps add uh, a further dimension to it, that families don't exist with, without individuals either. So actually, uh, you, you helped me out. Uh, yes, uh, as, as, uh, as uh, the family is something which is uh, connecting the individual and society. So that is something in between the two. And in fact, uh, sharing uh, uh, both aspects, the individual aspect and the social aspect. Because we feel like uh, at home, but we also uh, have to interact with each other. So in that sense, we are also social when in that family position. So thanks uh, for helping me out and answering Catherine's um, question. Now I try to push oh this goodness. one. No, that one. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe this way, yes. Yes, that's it, yeah, that's right. So I have got three things to offer. In a good French way. <laughs> <laughs> but in uh, Rome do as the, the French do. <laughs> so uh, as you 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 uh, uh, see in the in the title, I, I talk about Roger Scruton and his forerunners. So I need to talk about the British conservative tradition. Then I give you that's the main part. His views on the individual and the, the community. And finally, I give uh, three particular forms of uh, political community that uh, seems to be relevant for him. So let's uh, start with the British conservative tradition. In the British analytical tradition, you always have these uh, initials or, or short, uh, uh, shortenings of the terms of the BCT. What is this about? Uh, British conservative tradition, uh, when we have a course on British conservative tradition, we start with uh, with uh, with Burke it it's it might be questioned because uh, it implies that perhaps uh, the time before uh, Burke is not relevant uh, for this topic which sounds strange because Burke uh, uh, died uh, at the, the end of the 18th century which means that uh, that perhaps uh, nothing is important before that time but then why conservatism is not conservatism about you know tradition uh, long-term uh, issues uh, and in a way the answer is no uh, uh, conservatism is a modern phenomenon because this uh, person is reacting uh, on the french revolution as you see uh, these two quotes that i have is about uh, uh, is from his book on on uh, the french revolution which is a modern phenomenon so in a way uh, conservatism needs to be understood as a reaction uh, to a modern phenomenon which is the revolution, uh, and in particular the revolution in France. And I brought these two famous uh, uh, quotes, one about uh, the intergenerational aspect of uh, the social contract that uh, Burke claims, and the other one is about uh, what he calls the little platoons. Uh, so uh, uh, in a large scale uh, uh, perspective and this uh, this focus on the, on the small one. The large scale as, uh, aspect is that in a way he tries to distinguish his position from that of uh, Rousseau, who was quite famous in the age and uh, who had a special view on the social contract. And he wants to present another view, uh, uh, a competing view, because of course philosophers are always struggling or, or, or competing with each other. You know? That's 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 uh, what we like to do. So uh, it's a contract, okay, but uh, a special kind of contract, a partnership, he says. And then we can, of course, think about the difference between the term contract and partnership. What is the difference between the two? Uh, why he chooses to talk about partnership, and then a partnership in all arts. So it's a very general kind of partnership. Of whom? of uh, not simply the present members of the community, but uh, a partnership uh, between those who are living, those who are dead, and those who are to be born. 
which is of course a, an impossibility, a, a nonsense, because how can you contract with someone who is not born? But the idea is to, that, uh, in fact, when we are members of a, a society, we are members of a community which existed before us and which will uh, keep on existing after we die. So in a sense, there is something which is beyond our own life, something before and something after that. So in that sense, uh, if you want uh, to make sense of your society, you have to see it in a long span. And uh, that's uh, that's uh, a difference uh, between the Rousseauist uh, position and and the position of uh, classical liberals like John Locke, who all agree that well, we have to uh, make a social contract among ourselves, but not more. It's it's just uh, those who are you know partners to it uh, because they are alive. Uh, that's that's a first uh, prerequisite uh, for them. And then the little platoons. Uh, the small uh, little parts of the community that uh, that are important, uh, i.e. that uh, we should not under, uh, um, imagine uh, a community, uh, 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 a political community, as something homogeneous that uh, that uh, is uh, you know built up from uh, little bricks like like uh, individuals, uh, like like uh, uh, small. Uh, atoms, uh, uh, to use the, this term uh, taken from uh, physics, but rather uh, we should imagine a community uh, uh, building up from uh, smaller units, smaller communities. So it's a community of communities. That's the idea. And if we want to understand how the big one is actually uh, operating, what we need to understand is how the smaller ones are operating. So that's uh, why we have to uh, focus on them. And they, these are uh, 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 the little platoons uh, that, uh, that he calls, these, these small units, like small islands within the sea. The sea is the uh, whole community and the little uh, platoons, the little islands are the small units that uh, is built, that uh, is used as the bricks of that. Uh, that was Edmund Burke and the late 18th century. A uh, uh, long step forward to this rally and one nation conservatism. Uh, this is um, uh, the second half of the 19th century in Britain. A lot of developments uh, since the time of uh, Burke and the French Revolution. And the most important one is this um, uh, break within society, this, uh, this uh, schism, uh, the schism between uh, the rich and the poor. Of course, uh, there were always uh, people who are rich and uh, who are poor in any societies, but uh, there was no awareness or there was no public discussion of it at least. And, and in this respect, uh, this is an age when it, it becomes, uh, of course, uh, quite important. Uh, if you think about Marx's um, uh, uh, manifesto, the communist manifesto from 1848, you see what I mean, and again, uh, there is this modernist agenda, and there is a conservative uh, answer uh, that indeed it's not good if a political community is divided uh, so deeply. So what you require is to try to uh, reach out uh, and, and connect the two parts, and that's what non one nation conservatism is about, to try to unite a, a, a divided nation. And I think this is something that we can consider with our own uh, uh, particular backgrounds and experiences, because a lot of uh, societies nowadays, and in particular in the Western world, are divided uh, in a very important ways and, and very deeply. Like the US, like my own country, I come from uh, Hungary, which is in the eastern part of Europe, uh, beyond the Iron Curtain, if you see it from this side. But I think that, uh, that even in France, uh, you can claim that there are important uh, um, uh, schisms in society and that you need to overrush it. And, and um, the sort of discussion that, uh, that Israel presents is how to try to uh, bridge that. Again, a, a, a large step, uh, Eliot and cultural conservatism. Uh, this is uh, from a poem, so I uh, really should be careful about uh, trying to explain it because poems work differently than political philosophy, we have to keep in mind. T.S. Eliot is an American who studied philosophy but became 
perhaps the most important modernist uh, uh, poets uh, of the early 20th century, uh, moved to England and became a conservative. A very interesting story on its own uh, terms. But uh, uh, this uh, poem, which is again <laughs> one of the keystones of uh, modernist poetry, is about uh, uh, the role of the dead in our lives, which is uh, it does not sound like a modernist issue <laughs> on its own. But uh, the thing is that uh, what he claims is uh, indeed if we want uh, to understand. Uh, our community, which is uh, in this case England, and again we are talking about an American in England, so um, that's that's something uh, which needs to be uh, considered. England is something that is not only the present moment; uh, it's also uh, something that is always there. England is a term uh, uh, which uh, which covers many centuries, many different contexts. Uh, it's uh, the it's an ideal in that sense. It is something that never existed because ideals don't exist uh, like uh, like mater material objects. So in that sense, it's the never and it's the always. Uh, England taken as a general concept, as, as uh, a concept which is built up from the very different uh, experiences of very different uh, generations uh, and uh, including those who are dead by now. So in a way, it represents a return to the Burkean idea of this contract between the different uh, generations presented in a poetic form this way, this time. And the fourth example, and that's my final one uh, for this uh, first uh, topic that I wanted to discuss is uh, Michael Oakshot, uh, uh, a long life, uh, uh, lived uh, basically uh, in Cambridge and then in London and then in uh, 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 the countryside of England. And this is an essay on being conservative. And uh, what uh, this, uh, which is perhaps the most, uh, 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 the best, best known uh, of, of his uh, essays. He is an essay writer, basically. And he writes very nice and uh, artistic uh, uh, forms of essays. And uh, in this one, he argues that, in fact, conservatism is not a political ideology. It's not a creed or a doctrine. That's what he refers to. It's not something that politicians uh, should be uh, uh, using or misusing, but a disposition, something uh, like an attitude which is born with us, that is uh, in us, in fact, in all of us. That's, that's his claim. And then you should test it by by examining yourself, whether you have got an element like that, uh, conservative disposition, whether you like things that you know better than the, the ones that you don't know, whether you prefer the trite or the untried fact to mystery and so on and so on. Uh, so there are uh, natural character traits of any human being, that's the argument, which can be called conservatives. And when we talk about conservatism, we mean those uh, character traits in us. Okay, and the final one uh, uh, beyond the poor the forerunners is himself, Roger Scruton, uh, a British analytical philosopher of art and the political philosophy, educated in Cambridge, teaching at Burbeck College in London, establishing his own organs, uh, Salisbury Review, and uh, working beyond the Iron Curtain against uh, communism uh, before 1990, then teaching in the US in the uh, second half of the 90s, buying a farm in Wiltshire and there establishing the family that uh, you saw on the picture, bringing up his two children there, knighted by Prince Charles and decorated also by countries in Eastern Europe because of his work uh, before 1990. Uh, against the communist uh, totalitarian regimes over there. So he is our uh, main. Let's see his views on, in the, on the individual and community. We are uh, using this book, not a big one, a very uh, short one actually, on human nature, published uh, as you see in the last years of his life, and uh, um, trying to summarize his. Uh, views on 
philosophical anthropology. That's the part of philosophy which deals with human nature. And he tries to uh, capitalize on his knowledge of evolutionary biology and psychology, which is uh, not uh, problematic for an analytical philosopher. Uh, because analytical philosophy is that part of philosophy that is practiced in the Anglo-Saxon world and which claims that philosophy is in fact quite close to natural science is in fact should be in constant uh, interaction and uh, communication with natural sciences. So he is expected actually to look at these sciences if, you, if uh, he wants to understand human nature. But more importantly for our present purposes, he is uh, interested in uh, a specific uh, uh, trend in contemporary philosophy, contemporary continental philosophy, which is the uh, philosophy of Europe uh, uh, on this side of the uh, channel, and that is phenomenology. Uh, 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 a philosophical uh, idea, trend, uh, movement, uh, discourse, which uh, wants to look at uh, the human being, unlike uh, natural science, which uh, uh, provides an external uh, point of view of the human being, but uh, a, a point of view of the human being, which includes an internal aspect as well, trying to make sense of the human being by looking into our own selves. Because the claim is that if you look uh, at the at the individual from the outside, you don't see his or her thoughts. And without our thoughts, we are not uh, the human beings that we are. So you need the, the thoughts there as well. And therefore, you need an internal aspect as well. And science has no direct access to that, unfortunately. At least uh, not to natural science. There are certain... Uh, forms of science that try to reach out. I wonder how far they can get uh, there. But phenomenology is a philosophical uh, school that tries to include that. And the basic idea uh, that uh, uh, Scruton wants us to understand is that uh, the human being is not uh, the atomistic individual that the classical liberal position presents us. According to classical liberalism, we are individuals, free and autonomous beings who can decide what to do uh, because we have got reasons, uh, uh, arguments, and we have got that uh, capacity to, to handle them. Uh, we have rationality. We have a mind uh, which uh, can process uh, those uh, ideas. And uh, in that way, we become free actors with a free will. So freedom of uh, thought, uh, freedom to decide for ourselves, freedom of uh, will and uh, freedom to act. It sounds great. And I think uh, uh, there is no reason to, de to deny that we are those. But uh, according to phenomenology, that's not the end of the story. Uh, and it's not the beginning of the story either. It's uh, the thing between the, uh, the beginning and the end. And uh, uh, we need to take into account the end as well. And that is to understand that in order to have a clear view of ourselves, we need to understand that we are ourselves because we are aware of the others and the other is aware of us. That's the basic uh, uh, pre uh, 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 condition to make sense of ourselves. We are not starting to think our ourselves by saying, "Well, here I am. Let's uh, see what to do." The the thing is that uh, the child, when uh, she is born, uh, has a face uh, before her, which is the face of her mother of her father, the face of her, her uh, sisters and, and brothers and other people. And that's the first impression that, uh, that, uh, that she gets. In. And, and this is the uh, all important thing that in order to make sense of herself, she is in need of the others. And she gets those impressions from uh, the others. 
So my self-identification as a self, as myself, <laughs> as an I, depends on the you. The, it's a relative term. It's not an absolute term. I can only make sense if we have you. Because I am the one who is addressing you. I talk now to you. So I am the I. You are the you for me. And the, and the other way around. You are looking at me and, and, and try to make sense uh, of it from your own perspective. I and you is in constant uh, interaction. And that makes it possible for us to make sense of ourselves. I have these thoughts, so I know that I am, because I address those thoughts to you. And you either agree with that or disagree with that or uh, have no idea, uh, ideas whether you agree or disagree. But in any case, you relate to what I say. And in that sense, uh, you are uh, identifying yourselves in connection with what I say or don't, because you don't want to. That's also an option for you. So in that sense, there is this constant interaction between I and you. I requires the you and the other way around. So I cannot uh, use the first person without taking into consideration the second person. And that brings us to these um, most important aspects of uh, uh, the human community. Uh, that is uh, the foundation for responsibility. I have to take responsibility for my actions because you uh, can uh, uh, ask uh, what I do uh, from me. You can uh, uh, request an argument, a defense of what I do. Why do you talk so long and about so uh, uninteresting questions you can ask, for example, right now uh, from me? And in that sense, uh, I have to give arguments why I am talking about this. I have to be responsible for this talk. And, and the same way morality, law, institutions, religion, love and that, all of them depend on this interaction between the I and the you, I and the others. And human relations are in that sense all important for self-knowledge. That's, that's the argument. It's not a self-knowledge for its own sake. It's uh, the self-knowledge that uh, uh, is uh, raised by this uh, constant interaction between ourselves. What we are is what we are for each other. It's, it's uh, it does not make sense to claim that I am Ferenc Hörcher from this little country in a faraway a world called uh, Hungary and uh, in that, in that uh, small city called Budapest and so on, without relating it to Paris, uh, where we are now discussing this uh, and, and, uh, and all the other uh, particular circumstances that I uh, present myself as Ferenc Hörcher in all those situations. I present it uh, to someone in order to make sense. And even if when I'm considering myself, I go home and think, uh, well, that was perhaps not my best talk uh, for my life. I am talking to myself in the name of you. Uh, so in a way, I have got uh, the imagined you uh, from the perspective of which I try to make sense of my own uh, performance. And in that self, uh, sense, the self is a social product. It's not that it's there. Uh, per se, it's something that is born uh, by the, 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 the interaction between the I and the you. You have to realize that there are certain thinkers in the background, but uh, that's uh, perhaps not so important for those who are not in philosophy. Wittgenstein and his views on the impossibility of a private language, that I cannot use a language without someone else also using it, uh, uh, because otherwise the, that language would not exist. I cannot uh, just uh, create a language and use it for my own self. And the same way, uh, the concept of recognition by Hegel is there. And this is uh, uh, something that, uh, in fact, uh, creates the possibility of the idea of uh, moral responsibility and legal responsibility as well. In a community, we have got uh, uh, individuals, okay, the, the classical liberal individual, free to decide what to do and uh, free to act it out. But in a community, you always have to uh, uh, be able to explain what you did. 
because otherwise you will do something that will be not uh, uh, welcomed by the others. And then you will be uh, perhaps uh, punished for them by the others. Uh, you know, alone, uh, you know, society is always stronger than you. So in a way you have to deal with that situation. Uh, it's not enough uh, that you have got the freedom to decide, but you also have to give an account of it. You have to be re a responsible uh, actor uh, you, who is able to respond and uh, who is aware of obligations and commitments. So it's not absolute freedom, unfortunately. Gentlemen, it's a freedom that is conditioned uh, by a, a social context. And that's uh, the result of this IU relationship that uh, he keeps uh, emphasizing. And it also leads us, um, uh, so that's uh, uh, his uh, explanation of the birth of, of this uh, uh, individual, the autonomous uh, and free individual. But then there is a development to that idea as well, that persons are not uh, uh, final in the sense that uh, as a young man, we are not the same persons uh, as an old man. I know it because I'm old, you don't necessarily know it because you are all young. So uh, by aging, your personality develops and becomes uh, different. So it's person who is a, a process or something that is in a process. Uh, and, in that, uh, and for that reason, self-development is crucial. You cannot... Uh, claim that, well, my uh, personality is that, and that's all I cannot help about it, and, uh, uh, and you should not punish it. You uh, have to learn from your own personal examples or uh, experiences, and you have to develop yourself. You are responsible for that uh, development that happens with you, and that's uh, where character and virtue becomes crucial for him. Uh, we are not... Uh, free in the sense uh, as well that uh, we are a character that uh, we, for which uh, we are responsible. Uh, what uh, I am depends on what I did earlier in an importance. And perhaps that's the most important thing uh, that, that I did that and that, X and Y, and X plus Y uh, created a certain uh, character that I have. And in that sense, uh, you can become virtuous or you can become evil as well. There is a, you know, a whole uh, a spectrum of different options for you and you decide it by your decisions, but always in interaction with the others. It's, a, it's like a trial and error uh, process. You try out something like uh, when you are free, you try to rebel. And then when you get uh, older and get married and get children, you realize that, well, there are other things to do besides uh, rebelling, and then uh, your character is developing, and, the, and, and you acquire virtues. And that's, that's uh, something that is not born with you. Virtue is something that you have to develop, but it's also a social construct in the sense that you uh, uh, develop it in constant interactions with the others. So uh, persons are moral agents, responsible moral agents with their virtues and vices in dialogue with the others, in constant dialogue with the others. Okay, and therefore it's a historical term. Well, uh, we could uh, discuss uh, this uh, distinction that he has between the libertarians and the communitarians uh, representing two extremes. The libertarians who, are, who go for the, the free individual that I described as the classical liberal position uh, in a somewhat dogmatic manner, and the communitarians, the others one, who in a way underestimate the importance of it or uh, push it back and uh, keep emphasizing the communal dimensions. Two extremes, and uh, Scruton claims that the truth is somewhere in between. You are both a free individual and you are someone who is the, defined by your interactions with others, with the community. Okay, uh, but uh, I don't have much time for all that uh, you see here, but let me go to the third topic that I would like to discuss, which is three forms of uh, political communities, 
the nation, the local community, and the religious community. First, about the nation. He has got two books which uh, might be relevant in this uh, respect. Uh, England and Allergy uh, is a claim that England, uh, his home country, uh, is in decline. Allergy is a literary form that you use when you are, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, considering someone in decline or dead. Uh, and you try to keep that uh, memory alive of, of that uh, something that is in decline on that. And he wants to keep alive uh, the tradition of England. And, uh, and that's why he writes this elegy. It's, uh, uh, my, it, it's what he says. My aim is that of all funeral orations to praise the dead. You see the, the Berkeley and, uh, and Elliot uh, uh, kind of uh, reference. And the, to cheer the survivors. That's the people who are not yet born. So in this sense, the connection between the past and, and the future generations is there. And the other book that uh, needs to be mentioned is The Need for Nations, uh, where he is uh, confronting the nationalism as an ideology in politics. And although he uh, does not uh, uh, accept either as his uh, ideology. What he claims is that uh, the notion uh, uh, that uh, nationality tries to emphasize or focus on the nation is crucial. He is talking from a conservative position, distinguishing his own one from nationalism, mm -hmm. uh, which is another ideology. Conservatives are not nationalists and nationalists are not conservatives. There are certain conservatives who claim that they are also nationalists. There might be certain uh, nationalists who might argue that they are also conservatives, but these are two ideologies, he claims. And uh, he also claims that nationalism has a point. And that point is that the nation is crucial. Why is that crucial? Because in fact, it's the nation state which has got uh, that uh, uh, fruitful result of the free individual. The free individual was born historically in uh, the uh, in the nation state, in the state uh, uh, defined by a political community called the nation. Of course, uh, there would be here, uh, it would be necessary here to uh, discuss uh, what sort of uh, a concept of the nation is he referring to? Is it ethnic, an ethnic concept, a cultural concept, um, a political concept, maybe a religious concept? These are different aspects of the nation, and one has to be careful about it because if you do not understand it correctly, you might misunderstand it, and you might have, therefore, uh, uh, mistaken judgments about it. Uh, and uh, But the claim is that although nationalism is something that he it does not endorse, in fact, he says nationalism is part of the pathology of national loyalty, the argument is that national loyalty is crucial. Why? Because it was uh, uh, the form that uh, classical liberals actually identified their position with, and also because, uh, in fact, his own political community, England, uh, is defined by in England is as he sees it uh, a nation uh, that is uh, not an ethnically defined nation but a nation which uh, is connected to a certain part of the world to a certain space a geographic location nation understood as uh, as uh, you know defined by the by the British uh, Isles. And uh, one can also ask, well, what was his views about nationalism in recent discussions? And here are some points that uh, uh, I try to uh, uh, provide you uh, as, as his own position. He was pro-Brexit, so in a way he was against uh, uh, Britain uh, as part of the European Union. But he was anti-Trump, claiming that uh, the Trump's uh, uh, intellectual capacity is rather low. Uh, and therefore, uh, the, the ideas and the, the sort of argument that he used were not really convincing. Well, we are talking about, you know, a Cambridge born, I mean, the Cambridge educated uh, 
philosopher who tried to make sense of uh, these political slogans of a politician. Uh, and the third thing is that there is this uh, uh, recent phenomenon called national conservatism uh, initiated by uh, an Israeli-born American uh, uh, philosopher, public uh, uh, protagonist, Yoram Hazani. And uh, Roger Scruton was for some time uh, uh, associated with that uh, movement, uh, partly because he gave talks uh, in some of their meetings. And, and then the question is uh, whether he would identify himself with that movement right now. But that's a, a question which we can hardly answer because he is dead by now. That was the first uh, issue, uh, the, the, the particular community, the nation. Let's talk about the, the second one, which is the local community. And in this respect, uh, his book on settlement might be crucial because what he describes there is his own uh, personal experience when he bought uh, this uh, cottage in the Wiltshire uh, called Sunday Hill Farm, later called Scrutopia, so the utopia of Scruton, Scrutopia. Uh, and there uh, he tried to establish uh, uh, his family. He got married and had children there. And he describes in a somewhat self-ironic manner the way that uh, this intellectual moves out into the countryside and meets the local farmers who make fun of him because he does not uh, do things properly and cannot uh, distinguish things properly according to their own standards. But uh, but at the end, this is a, a, an optimistic story. So as opposed to England analogy in settlement, he claims that well, it's still possible to have that uh, experience to establish your local uh, community in the most uh, physical sense, i.e. to, to uh, surround that, that particular physical space where you can establish uh, your own laws, your family laws, so to say, together, of course, with the members of your own, uh, family. And in constant interaction, again, with the, the others, because this uh, settlement is in a particular environment. So the interaction between the two is just as crucial as for the individual, the, the other person is important. Then there is this other book of him on hunting. Uh, which might be uh, an interesting and perhaps even uh, um, a questionable or controversial issue. He is defending uh, hunting as a, a British tradition, which is basically fox hunting on horseback and with hounds. Uh, but uh, the major argument that is used against it, which is that, well, it's an archaic uh, aristocratic tradition which uh, uh, keeps alive, uh, you know, uh, an, uh, exclusive society which is uh, also oppressive and and, uh, and unequal. His point would uh, show that in fact uh, hunting as uh, uh, practiced uh, by the local community that uh, he is uh, part of is in fact a rather uh, communal experience. Uh, the local uh, 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 farm holders are actually doing that. And in fact, it keeps alive certain traditions that are important for that particular uh, community. And in that respect, it has got uh, a legitimacy. Uh, and uh, if someone from the outside tries to uh, uh, criticize it, uh, he, he or she should do it by taking into account that particular function of it, which is to keep that society or that local community together. And the third book, uh, uh, which is important, uh, might be something that you would not expect from a conservative philosopher, a book on green ideas and ecology. But his point is that, in fact, it's the other way around, that uh, conservatism is the ideology which is closer to defending uh, the natural environment and uh, also social environment. Why? Because uh, conservatism is about conserving. Uh, and, and what else should be conserved before conserving uh, our environment and our um, uh, communities as well? Because, the, the, as I tried to explain it, though, that uh, communities are our natural environments as well. And here, the two terms that I call uh, attention to is stewardship and trusteeship, i.e., that uh, in our relationship to nature, to our natural environment, 
we uh, should not uh, uh, operate uh, like owners as if that was our exclusive right that uh, we can exercise over that uh, particular uh, property but rather uh, we should uh, 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 work and, uh, and uh, exercise our power as stewards uh, as the ones who uh, have to uh, uh, be uh, responsible for that field. Why? Because that uh, 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 part of uh, nature that we can uh, uh, take uh, 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 responsible action for will be uh, inherited by our children, uh, grandchildren, and so on and so on. So it's not our own property, it's the property of you know, generations uh, before and after us. So in that sense, we have to uh, uh, work like trustees uh, for, for the next generations. And there uh, he works out this concept of oikophilia, which is his own creation. It means the love of the household. Uh, and uh, he claims that all of us has this uh, primary experience that we like our houses, our uh, family homes, more than anything else in that actually. And that's, that's a, a crucial experience for any one of us. And there is a natural way of experiences in, in our childhood. We are happy with that or perhaps unhappy, but not uh, uh, without that sort of nostalgia, which will be a part of our later life. Then we get away from that home and then we return as uh, uh, and we get older and, and return to the same place and realize the importance of it uh, for our own life. And the final type of community that I, and I think that's the last line, let me check it, yes, is the religious community. Beyond the nation and beyond the local community, there is the religious community. And that's uh, because uh, he claims that, in fact, uh, there are three uh, spheres of um, human experience. The po perhaps the most obvious one is the political one, that uh, we are all uh, under the pressure of the po a particular political regime that we are part of. We depend on it uh, um, for our salaries, for our jobs, for everything that, uh, that we own, and so on and so on. But there are things um, beyond that layer. And uh, the first one is culture. Uh, and in that sense, he claims that culture is upstream from, from politics, i.e. that we cannot make sense of the particular political context that we have without taking a, a account of the political culture that creates it and that uh, it is part of. And in that sense, culture is upstream. It, uh, it is... Uh, prior uh, in its importance, uh, it, it defines politics. And he makes an even stronger claim, and I would be happy to talk about that because that's that's perhaps uh, even more against our uh, first uh, uh, you know gut reactions, uh, which is that religion is upstream from culture. I that if we want to understand our culture, we can only make sense of it if we understand how far it is defined and in what ways it is determined by culture, by, by religion. Uh, all of our cultures, uh, Western or non-Western, uh, it's uh, just a basic phenomenon of the human being that its culture is determined by the particular religious experiences of that uh, particular community. And in that sense, our communal experience is basically uh, 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 defined and determined and, uh, and uh, influenced by uh, our religious community, the experience of uh, a religious uh, community. And it is in this book, Our Church, a personal uh, history of the Church of England that he gives an account of his own uh, experiences, uh, of his own a religious community. He was an Anglic Anglican, for some time a non-believing Anglican, to be sure, and that's also part of the story of most uh, modern uh, experiences of religious community. Uh, but uh, something that uh, he returned to in his later life, and although he did not never have a kind of personal revelation, 
of a, a, a god or a divine presence or anything like that. What he uh, uh, decided in his later years was to become part of this particular uh, uh, religious community in this uh, countryside chapel that he attended. And there he uh, took uh, charge of uh, uh, being the organist of that uh, chapel because he uh, uh, was a good uh, uh, musician. He learned uh, to play the piano and, and actually he became quite um, uh, learned in, in music. He had got uh, uh, works on, uh, on uh, the aesthetics of music and he also practiced music. He uh, uh, created uh, two operas and uh, and uh, those were also performed. And as an organist, uh, he participated in the uh, services of the local church, uh, as an Anglican, uh, uh, as a uh, as a member of the Anglican religious community, even if he did not have that uh, particular experience. Uh, and that's why he finds it important to present the church not as it is. You know, most historians try to present the churches that they deal with as it is. Uh, uh, and also, there are those theologians who present the church as they want it to, uh, to be. What he presents is the church that he experienced, or the church of his own personal experience, the interaction between him and the church as he uh, himself experienced it. And Part of that story is the actual practice that he did, because he thought that uh, philosophers are not simply defined by their texts, uh, but also by their uh, lives, their particular way of life that they have chosen. And that's why it's important to make uh, uh, responsible uh, choices uh, if you are a philosopher in your life, because otherwise students like you would ask, well, it's very nice to see your stories there in your books, but what about your real life? Well, let's give an account of that as well. So in that uh, connection, he identified his own uh, understanding of the role and function of the philosopher. So that's that's uh, what I had to present today. I'm looking forward to questions and comments. It was a little bit longer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much because this allows us to get into the discussion. Um, for anyone who didn't know or just recognizing that we will summarize the more than 50 books that he wrote in his lifetime, even though he focused on a, on a, a number of them, allowing us to really have a, a broad view of, uh, of his thinking. Obviously not, there is, a, a, I think, a lot that, that can be discussed, but I've got my questions, but I mean, who would like to start? Um, <laughs> So I can see there is Shane. So before you start, present yourself, perhaps say where you come from, and so it will be easier, and then you can uh, Hello, it's uh, Marat here. So my name is uh, Shane Ami, I'm from India. Um, uh, I'm a second year student of my thesis, actually, about um, the connection between exile and the formation of political identity and state by extent. So, so the first thing I would note is that you said that you know conservatism is a modern phenomenon. Um, I actually think I, I would have to disagree. I think it's actually the most basic form of human existence, and I do not mean that in a positive way. Um, I think if you read from the history, uh, the modern phenomenon would be uh, liberalism, and by maybe by extent, secular as well. Conservatism has been Maybe not, maybe more in a term, in, in Protestant terms, in terms of political parties, solidified in terms of conservative behavior in terms of in global, uh, in terms of vote. But as a, as a way of thinking, it actually has been the, has been the first reaction of human humans collectively and individually of history. Um, he seems like a good guy. Uh, I mean, he seems like a great professor, but um, I, I wouldn't vote for him. Um, <laughs> I did not want you to vote for him. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's too much um, too much harshness uh, as a way of thinking. Um, I think he also mixed between. I think he, he mixes a lot between 
partisan conservatism based in terms of party politics. And conservatism is maybe uh, a sociological phenomenon specific to certain groups, which I believe he belongs to. Um, I also think that I didn't understand like his, um, his link between ecology and conservatism. I think he also mixes between, because ecology by definition does not acknowledge conservatism in the way he thinks of it. What he talks about is the preservation in its communal term, in terms of poverty to a community and not necessarily on a universal scale. He does seem to talk about the plant as if it were a piece of land that might belong to a family or a clan and should be protected. It's not the same thing, especially all in terms of policy when you plant it, the salt of policy is actually quite a That's it. Thank you. Uh, let me uh, try to uh, answer it. Of course, uh, it's uh, it's uh, terms that uh, we have to define when we, we um, discuss issues. And then perhaps the first term, conservatism, uh, which might be interesting, because when you uh, refer to conservatism as something that <clears throat> is always there uh, in history, uh, and uh, you also imply it in a negative way, uh, then you use it uh, uh, the term in a certain sense. And in that sense, it means, uh, at, at least that's my first impression, and then yeah. I might want to explain it, as uh, uh, the ideology of the establishment, i.e. how to defend the status quo, what we have got here uh, now. And, and, and of course, each and every regime uh, is in need of trying to, to uh, have those... Uh, arguments to defend its uh, establishment in the, and in, if that's uh, conservatism indeed with every regime we will have it but i think that uh, that it's although it's a legitimate uh, use of the term it's a narrow uh, term and i would like uh, to offer another um, option how you can uh, identify or or um, uh, make sense of the term and that is uh, to understand it uh, as uh, part of human nature. And that's, uh, that's uh, in fact, nothing to do with, with politics on, on the first uh, level. It's something to do with uh, how we define the relationship of ourselves to our uh, communities, to the others. Uh, philo uh, philosophers use the term uh, the other in that sense to define the uh, uh, community uh, as a, as a uh, partner in a dialogue between me and, and, and you. And I think that, uh, that that's, uh, that's uh, another uh, sense of the term conservatism. And I think it's a legitimate uh, uh, claim. And, and you might actually say that, well, that even if I, I, I go for that, that might be longer than, uh, than uh, uh, just modernity. In that sense, uh, you can still argue that, well, it was there uh, uh, all uh, during uh, during the whole human history. But I think uh, that might be true, but uh, here my point would be that uh, the reflection on that uh, thing, that there is that uh, character trait, is the modern phenomenon. So even if there was this uh, uh, habit of trying to um, uh, 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 of of, uh, of um, experiencing the dialogue with, between me and the other, between the individual and the community. In fact, in all traditional societies, that's the relationship between the I and the you. The sort of reflection that uh, I presented here is a modern one. That's, that's the claim, that it's, it's part of the experience of a post-French uh, uh, Enlightenment uh, and post-Kantian uh, uh, moment in, in, the, uh, history, in the history of philosophy. Why? Because it was Kant who defined the individual as a noumenon, as uh, something which has its own value without taking into consideration anything else. And in this, this sense, the reaction is to this uh, Kantian position that he provides, i.e. that that noumenon it cannot be made sense. The being uh, an sich cannot be understood without uh, taking into account uh, 
the, the, the social aspect to it, the Ding für sich. Uh, so the two things uh, uh, are uh, together. Uh, the, 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 the Kantian separation does not hold. And in this sense, he is a post-Kantian thinker. He is a Hegelian thinker who claims that individuals uh, have these uh, three levels of uh, personal experience, the family level, the, 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 the social level, civil society level, and the state level. And all of them are important uh, if we want to make sense of the human being. It's not uh, just the human being as such that we need to understand. That's, that's for, for, for your uh, first uh, point. As, as, as for the uh, second, uh, uh, it is, uh, I think, uh, important to see that, that uh, the, which is about the green philosophy thing, I, I would reflect on that, uh, that uh, uh, conservatives are very skeptical about global uh, actions. They think that there is no, so far, no experience of go global community. We are just, uh, uh, you know, blind in that respect because we uh, we only know things which we know by, from experience, and we do not have an experience of a global community. And therefore, uh, uh, conservatives are cautious because they think that if we want to uh, uh, experience with something that we have never experienced before, that might be dangerous. And in that respect, the French Enlightenment is uh, their crucial moment uh, when they realize that, well, there are these large scale uh, experiences of, of human uh, societies which can cause uh, thousands and uh, hundreds of thousands of deaths. And I'm coming from a country uh, uh, which when I was born was communist, uh, totalitarian country. And I know what uh, these uh, uh, critics of the French Enlightenment thought from personal experience because a totalitarian regime is a regime which does not provide you with the, uh, with the uh, everyday uh, possibility of free choices. And in this respect, uh, I am uh, uh, aware of this uh, danger that the conservatives call attention to, i.e. that uh, if you want large-scale social uh, experiences, like uh, the French Enlightenment, or like uh, like uh, 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 communism, or like the Nazi uh, experience, they can cause uh, thousands and hundreds of thousands of deaths. Uh, so in that respect, uh, they are cautious. They want uh, local action. And they think that, uh, in fact, even global challenges need to be addressed on the level that uh, we are aware of and that we can handle properly, which is the local, the national, and sometimes there are international organizations which, uh, of, of which uh, we have got certain experiences, uh, how they work and how far uh, they can uh, be relied on. And th th this is the, the present uh, moment. It might be the case that in hundreds of years we will have experiences of other situations, but so far, uh, we cannot uh, act globally. In that uh, sense, they are skeptical. And you might say that, well, uh, I am op optimist, but uh, I try to explain why they are skeptical. Mm -hmm. But that was, it's just, I'm sorry, but it's just, it, to me, it sounds like if I was an average British citizen in this moment, listening to him, would sound less uh would sound less as somebody who's concerned with issues, major issues, including the war, then and more like this upper class posh person who has never been to uh, East London, never seen so was never even going to so I love East London, who's never seen the complexities of of these issues and just to downgrade them to this family and this to me it sounds like a neo I'm sorry but, uh... maybe maybe that's because I did not explain his family background which is that he is coming from a lower middle class background his father being a schoolmaster in a local school a, a, a labor sympathizer 
and very strong uh, critique of um, uh, British aristocratic uh, traditions and society, and the brutal man as well, uh, which means that because uh, he was uh, uh, disillusioned and, and uh, uh, his life was in ruins in many ways, and he was brought up in that um, uh, environment, uh, not really uh, easy to handle. And it's very interesting uh, that by the end of his life, uh, he tried to, because he had serious conflicts with his father, and partly because he went, uh, went to Cambridge, and uh, his father thought that, well, you go to, to, to those elite schools and you become a, a member of the elite and all that. Uh, and at the end of his life, he tried to uh, uh, reach out and try to make sense of the life of his father because he thought that that might be important. Uh, and what he understood was that this uh, person uh, who had that uh, that unfortunate uh, uh, and and disillusioned life was very keen on certain issues. As a labor voter, he was uh, for equality and uh, opportunity for everyone. But he was also defending uh, English uh, uh, liberty, and he was also a defender of uh, local uh, 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 environments. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, collecting signatures uh, on the marketplace to defend uh, the particular parts of the uh, of the local uh, 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 district that uh, he lived in, and uh, and and. Uh, and arguing that, well, if you destroy your past, uh, you destroy your communities. And by the end of his life, actually, while there were these criticisms uh, uh, that uh, that you mentioned uh, uh, as, as yours uh, addressed to uh, Scruton, he became one of, uh, or, or at least uh, tended to become, maybe not, uh, he hasn't become yet, but tended to become a blue labor, someone for whom uh, uh, actually uh, the, the working class virtues of uh, uh, the English uh, post-war uh, uh, era were all important, and particularly the sort of uh, communal life of the working classes was uh, exemplary uh, for him, and he thought that uh, uh, governments uh, and, and uh, of course uh, that was uh, partly the Thatcher governments that he had in mind. Uh, disregarded uh, those uh, uh, values, in fact, and, and in that respect, he um, uh, agreed uh, on more than he uh, expected with his, his father's legacy. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, there is Stefan Fassman and Valkista. Stefan yeah. uh, Forillon, a senior lecturer in British studies in uh, the University of Tours. Thank you very much for your stimulating uh, presentation. And uh, let me be a uh, French as well by uh, keeping three as a sacred member. So three quick questions for you. Uh, my first one is um, taking into account what you said in your second part, that uh, aging is a process of getting virtue. Uh, what, what about Scruton himself? Because uh, um, in your third part, you uh, mentioned the book he wrote in, uh, two, in 2004, The Need for Nations. But in the early um, 80s, uh, he was the editor of the Salisbury Review and published a few things. So my first question is, did his view on the concept of nation change from the 80s to the early uh, 21st century? My second question is, when uh, you gave your references about England, uh, analogy in decline, uh, I know Scruton uh, managed to uh, meet with Enoch Powell, but Powell had put forward such arguments much earlier. So uh, was Scruton a Powellite? And my last question, uh, I, have no, I don't have the answer, but I've read in, in books that uh, Scruton's view of the organic society uh, coming from Burke was not really convincing in the late 20th century in a practical way. I don't know why people have said that about his view of the organic society. So if you can give me a possible answer, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, these are hard questions. And uh, let me try to address uh, at least uh, as far as I can. 
them. Uh, first, about uh, uh, the differences of, of, of Scruton's uh, earlier and later views. Uh, I guess you were right, uh, and I, I guess it, it would be true about most uh, philosophers uh, that, that uh, indeed uh, we, we grow and, and, and uh, uh, get uh, insights into things that we were not aware of earlier. So in that sense, uh, surely he, he changed his views. And also, uh, particularly the political uh, situations in, in those uh, days, uh, like uh, the 80s, uh, before 1919, which was a bipolar world in a Cold War context, uh, Iron Court uh, Curtain over there. And I think that's also crucial that he had that experience of uh, uh, communist uh, uh, Eastern Europe uh, going over uh, to uh, across the Iron Curtain, taking, uh, in fact, real risks uh, to give underground uh, 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 classes and, and courses, uh, not only to students, but the interested um, uh, uh, people uh, in, in those countries who wanted to hear some real uh, words about uh, uh, things that were, were forbidden to talk about uh, in those days. Uh, and 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 after 1990, when um, you know uh, Eastern Europe uh, got a, 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 a membership in the European Union and so on and so on, but I think that that basically uh, his position, uh, as far as uh, uh, England is concerned, did not change much. Perhaps uh, with one exception, which is that uh, perhaps in the 80s he would have described himself as a British conservative. And by the end of his life, he would uh, describe himself as an English uh, conservative. And of course, that's that's uh, something of a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 one can ask why and what are the consequences of it. And uh, I think that uh, I mentioned this uh, Brexit uh, position that you took, and I think that's part of of, of it. But uh, but uh, but further issues might be involved. Uh, Powell, that's the next uh, issue. Uh, I think that, in fact, uh, Powell is underestimated uh, as far as his uh, influence is concerned in, in the intellectual world and also in politics, partly because of, uh, of his uh, famous uh, speech, uh, which, which made him in, in, impossible in many circles. And also, uh, as a result of that, uh, his, his intellectual status. But he was, I think, intellectually quite influential. And I can easily imagine that that Scruton was uh, under his influence in, in many respects. I haven't found many uh, real references to him, but that might be because uh, uh, power was a taboo. Not the, cor the personal correspondence or something? Or I'm not aware of that. I'm not aware. I did not uh, focus on that. Uh, I, I focused uh, uh, on his relationship uh, with uh, Thatcher uh, and with, uh, with uh, the conservative circles uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, were against him or for him. But, uh, but uh, I don't know much about the power, the uh, Scruton power issue, but my uh, guess is that it must have been uh, relevant. So in that respect, I think that, that that's a relevant uh, question. And, and uh, I, I, I would be happy to, if, if, if you uh, could try, because perhaps on, on the power side, there could be some, some references as well. Uh, that's, that's the second thing. And, and the third thing is the organic society right. issue. I wonder, I mean, uh, I, I don't know much about uh, Scruton as an organic uh, thinker, of course, he is Hegelian. And uh, Hegel has a bad reputation in English language philosophy, <laughs> uh, which uh, might be partly because uh, actually in Oxbridge, uh, they finish um, modern philosophy with, with Kant. <laughs> and they don't learn any Hegel at, at all, but that's, of course, an exaggeration. But, uh, but, but also because uh, because of course Hegel is associated with uh, uh, with uh, continental uh, reactionary thought, uh, uh, partly with good reason. I he's part of in the Prussian regime and uh, his reactions uh, uh, to certain uh, 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 you know intellectual trends of the Romantic period. 
But uh, but I think that that in fact uh, Hegel is a much more relevant thinker that uh, that uh, English speakers uh, speaking philosophers uh, would admit. So I and 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 Scruton had this uh, particular knowledge of continental philosophy that most uh, British uh, analytical philosophers, in particular in the Oxbridge uh, idiom, uh, would be aware. Of. So in that sense. Uh, his Hegel is, is much closer to reality. Uh, and in, in that respect, uh, I would call attention to um, the work of uh, Charles Taylor, the Canadian yes. philosopher who had this huge volume on, on Hegel um, in, the, in the 70s, I guess. Uh, and I think that, that Scruton's position is quite close actually to Taylor because they were uh, also connected and they had the uh, actually dialogues with each other, basically on religion, actually, because uh, Taylor was a, a left-wing Catholic uh, in, in a Canadian context, but someone who, for whom uh, Catholicism was quite important uh, uh, philosophically. And, and, and Scruton uh, and him uh, had, uh, had a great discussion on them, and I think that, uh, that they were quite close uh, on, on, the, on Hegel. And I think that all these organic uh, metaphors that are used are accusations of Hegelianism by people who did not read much Hegel, to be sure. But that's my own impression, and, and don't uh, don't trust me and, and uh, double check it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you, Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your offering talk. Uh, my name is Belkis Mugu. I'm a second year PhD student working on uh, manifestations of populism within the British Conservative Party. I'm happy to have my two supervisors here. Because that makes all good be <laughs> Well, I've got a question on the challenge of working on political theory, I mean, studying the authors, the political philosophers of conservatism, and uh, working on political discourse, studying the policies, uh, the ideas of politicians, etc. Do you think it's possible like to, to uh, build, to apply uh, abstract theoretical frameworks of conservatism on very perplexing party like the British Conservative Party, in which there's a sort of elasticity in terms of economic policy, uh, the role of the state, uh, in which there is a number of conflicting conceptions of society. Uh, so in, in, I mean, in your research uh, on the conservative thought, have you observed the disconnect between uh, the intellectual type of conservatism and the party-based type of conservatism? And if so, which one of the two conceptions better encapsulates uh, British conservatism as a political idea? Uh, of which you do? Uh, the intellectual brand, the intellectual type, as okay. you have done in your, in your okay. research studying the philosophers, the okay. authors. Okay, or the political. The fact okay. of studying political discourse, politicians, okay. I mean, people okay. like uh, Enoch Powell and Lord Johnson. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, that's that's a good question, I think, and, and quite relevant because uh, of course, my topic today was uh, British intellectual conservatism, or rather British conservative intellectual, which is a uh, difference. Uh, and uh, in, in this, because at one point, uh, Scruton writes when he tried to, because as a young man, he wanted to become a politician and he applied uh, to the conservative party, that whether he can run, first to become a member and then to, to whether he can become a candidate uh, for uh, the position of an MP, and he did not get the job <laughs> uh, from uh, his party. Uh, and uh, and then he writes that uh, I became from, a, uh, now let me put it uh, correctly, from a, 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 an intellectual conservative, I became a conservative intellectual. I, from someone who is uh, in the uh, conservative party context as an intellectual, an intellectual who has uh, uh, conservatism as uh, his research interest or her. And in that respect, uh, uh, I think it's, it's a very important uh, notion because of course, as an intellectual, I can have very nice ideas and do whatever I want. As a politician, I need to be elected, uh, at least in the, in the, in the British context, uh, uh, in order to have uh, you know any relevance whatsoever, so very different uh, challenges, very different uh, uh, standards of success and failure. Uh, in in a way, intellectuals uh, are in a luxurious position, 
because they can uh, think whatever they want and uh, no one can uh, ask uh, uh, how how far is that relevant for our present context or not well they can ask and they can uh, she can answer very different questions and that's it and and of course um, uh, politicians are in the you know the, the under the pressure of the moment you have to do something right now here and now uh, so uh, very uh, different uh, fields of arena or fields of action add to that uh, why i think it's it's, it's a crucial question that uh, i think that uh, the tory party right now is in ruins uh, i think that's that's uh, an obvious thing uh, that in the next election they at least so far as we know of course we do not know anything about the future so maybe tomorrow it will not be true but so far as we know they will be kicked out uh, from uh, from the government and, and they will become the opposition party and and even more in ruins as far as their intellectual capital is concerned so or maybe the two are not independent of each other that they are in ruins uh, in, in political terms because they are also in, in ruins in intellectual uh, terms. And that uh, makes it uh, pressing to, to say something about their relationship. And I think that the relationship is this. If uh, you are in favor of a, a, a political perspective, which says that politics, uh, uh, that, that culture is upstream from politics and religion is upstream from uh, 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 culture, you need to be intellectually sound, which does not mean that you have to have an intellectual politics, but you have to have a politics which is intellectually and culturally embedded and sound, because otherwise there is a contradiction against a, a, a performative uh, mistake. Uh, you say something and, and you did do a something else, you know? So therefore it's, it's crucial that they should have... A... On the other hand, conservative politicians are by definition uh, suspicious of uh, uh, of intellectuals. I know that it also from a personal experience because I'm considered as a conservative intellectual or an intellectual conservative rather, uh, and uh, and uh, I am coming from a party in which uh, a, a, a government is in power for certain years, which claims to be conservative, and, and I know that they are quite suspicious of me. Uh, which uh, does not mean that I'm not suspicious of them, but uh, that's a different issue. But uh, why are they suspicious? Because intellectuals uh, keep uh, shouting in from the outside that you have to do this, you have to do that, you know? And, and they are not aware of the particularities of, of uh, the, the really pressing issues. Uh, so in a sense, we are free and uh, they are under the pressure of, uh, of politics. So in, in that sense, uh, they have got good reasons why to be suspicious of us. On the, so yeah. is British conservatism, is it the flexibility or the same for you? Uh, I think uh, British conservatism <laughs> is in ruins because it's not flexible anymore. Okay. You know? It's in theory. Uh, it's, it's, it's not in theory either. <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, the problem is that it's, it's neither. Uh, for them, actually, theory is not important. It's ideology that is important. Um, I how to uh, how to sell their product, which is their uh, decisions and actions. Uh, and for that, uh, theory is needed. That's why I said that intellectuals are uh, important for them. But they don't uh, have a convincing uh, 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 ideology. That's why they will be kicked out. And they are not flexible because they don't have a, a political action either which would be convincing for voters. Neither a good ideology nor a good uh, political action, and you will be picked up. Yeah. Just a yeah. comment, not, not in the long term, but can, they cons can conservatism with it have convincing ideologies? We cannot, because by definition, conservatism is not always lost. <laughs> No, we're not going to answer this because it's not no Muslim is waiting. I'm not going to be able to ask a question. And it's already, we're, we're going to give it 10 minutes more if you don't mind too much. Um, no, it's, it's a quick, quick uh, question. Uh, Laurence Harris, a uh, lecturer at New Sorbonne University, uh, in part, we touched on that on my question, but it was about the legacy of um, uh, Roger Scott's ideas. Are there heirs within the Conservative Party today who openly acknowledge a legacy? Perhaps in Hungary as well. Sure. In both cases, there is a strong legacy, I would claim. 
In Hungary, you can see it from the network of uh, cafes that were established, and I wonder if you have heard about that, but most of the people who go, come to Hungary and are interested in, in, in politics would know about the, the, the so-called network of Scruton hubs or Scruton cafes, uh, where you can uh, uh, have uh, cafes in a, an environment which is uh, you know, honoring uh, the legacy, which is, of course, uh, connected to your question uh, of populism, whether uh, what to do with the with the tradition of a political thinker, and one of the ways that you can uh, you know capitalize on that is to to sell it in that in that context. Yes, so in that respect, on the other hand, uh, the the Hungarian government, uh, at least some of these uh, speaking heads of that, claim that they have got a better uh, conservatism or whatever for their policies than British conservatism. They claim that it's it's continental and it has different agendas. And so they don't go for the British conservatives. They are far away and they have different problems. So that's not uh, there. So the, the two things go, come together. And that's, again, a lesson that you can learn whether ideology and action uh, go hand in hand easily or, or not necessarily. As for, as for Britain, uh, I think that, in fact, uh, after the fall, I think the fall is coming, and after the fall, uh, actually, Scruton will become important, and there are by now signs of uh, of of this. And one of the signs is that uh, in uh, the summer there was this National Conservatism Summit in in London, where a number of MPs were invi invited from the Tory Party, and one where most of them actually. Uh, or, or or from around the party, and most of them actually refer to Scruton most of the time. So uh, that's that's something that is is by now visible. And I would also refer to this book by the Danny Kruger, the, uh, one of the members of the New Conservatives, who who is publishing this book Covenant, uh, which is uh, just coming out and which is addressing uh, that sort of. Uh, Scrutopian uh, uh, philosophically uh, established uh, sort of conservatism, which claims to be British conservatism per se, and something for the day. So I think uh, I, I actually gave a, a, a talk uh, recently where I, 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 I referred to Scruton as the lingua franca of uh, present day conservatism. And I mean it seriously. That uh, in fact, if uh, if there is uh, uh, you know um, a, a, a way of uh, presenting conservatism in the twenty first century, it's uh, through scrutiny. That's the most obvious one. You see it from uh, Georgia Meloni. You see it from the Sweden Democrats. You see it uh, in in Hungary, even though in this uh, way. You see it in Britain. Uh, you see it in France, uh, of course, you do not necessarily uh, like it uh, that you see it there. So in many ways, uh, uh, in very many different contexts of conservatism, like in, in Brazilian uh, conservatives, among the Brazilian conservatives, you, you keep referring to Spanish conservatives, you know, which are quite far away from the British tradition. Scruton uh, is some some, for some uh, reasons, saleable. It's 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 sold uh, and it's it it it's 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 uh, taken. Uh, in a way, actually, that's the most important uh, difficulty of that uh, legacy, that it becomes uh, an icon, a figure that that is uh, you know uh, inflated by this uh, political uh, use of of uh, of his legacy. Can I, can I just as a quick question on that because uh, thank you very much for your presentation, which is fascinating. Um, I would agree with uh, some of the questions about the disconnection of modern times. Uh, and I was wondering how could you explain that the Conservative Party massively instrumentalized people? That's mm -hmm. true. Um, um, but only Kruger, um, but I think recently, as I wrote, Smith, this vision of growing uh, bound conservatism massively and those, uh, the building the better commission uh, as well with the, and to some extent it seems to me that and I was wondering how Sputin himself reacted to that because to some extent he was very much at odds with that. I mean global Britain, what you said, 
is very different from his vision and his skepticism of global politics. And Zach's vision of the environment is very, very different because it's very much focused on modernity and, and modern use of resources and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. very much different mm -hmm. from us. And do you have any ideas about his own response to this instrumental yes. How he reacts from above to <laughs> this? <laughs> Yes, uh, of course, uh, in his own days, before the death, uh, he became something of a legend. He was knighted and all that. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, he was, the difference comes with his death. He became uh, like a boom of, of Scruton uh, scholarship. So we, we do not know exactly what uh, his reaction would be, but we can guess that he was, he was quite skeptical about, you know, the political uses of ideas. And so I, I would guess that he would be uh, skeptical, even if uh, you know the, the target was himself. Uh, so in that sense, uh, I, I, I would agree that 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 uh, that there is this the discrepancy. On the other hand, why on earth are we political philosophers here if we do not want to see some impact of our work on on uh, you know public uh, discussion on politics and such even if we cannot of course influence how exactly it will turn out so that's that's the risk of being an influential philosopher that sometimes the people will actually refer to you and you don't want to see that <laughs> perhaps I mean, on that point, Antonio here, who was a friend of his that I've, I've met several times and who was working with him in the Salisbury Review, did tell me very precisely that before the end of his life, uh, he was very uh, upset about the way yeah, about the way in which he'd been that, that's what I would... uh, by the unit and that he was also, he felt that he'd been misunderstood. Uh, that's the word that Antonio mm -hmm. used. And, and, uh, and so, and he himself, Antonio here, who is from the same generation and same understanding of life is also pretty sort of a skeptic about the way in which have been, things have been going. And that's that's the reason why we were discussing it. I mean, something needs to be done perhaps uh, on, on, on the, the, the work that they did and the influence of their work in the Salisbury Review or not. That's yes, it's, it's partly our responsibility as intellectuals to try to keep that uh, legacy clear from those uh, political uh, you know yeah. uh, uses and, and misuses of, of it and try to work out what is actually there because most of the people refer to to Scruton by by quotes that they take from the internet or things like that uh, without actually uh, you know taking the books and trying to uh, struggle with those because sometimes they are quite uh, hard uh, intellectual works they are read uh, readable and and uh, uh, you know uh, available but, but sometimes the people just use it without uh, or, or deliberately trying to misuse it for their own particular purposes. And that's the nature of politics, but the nature of our job, which is the nature of uh, uh, the intellectuals, job, the academics do job, is to try to, to uncover or, or you know, to, to try to clarify what exactly is the intellectual position that this or that uh, um, the thinker had and 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 try to reveal the mystifications are, are, are what sense are the mystifications and not the truth of it. it. Just to finish on this, perhaps is the fact that it is so difficult because precisely you if you're a philosopher you want your ideas to be taken, but then in fact if they are abused, or for example as you rightly said, somebody like George, that's what we were discussing, somebody like Giorgia Meloni using the Scrutonian arguments and at the same time. Um, she's not talking a language of reconciliation. So in fact, she's giving him a bad name. And that's very problematic because it's it's part of the conversation we had about you coming to talk about Scruton is that the, the impact it has is that the first element is, oh, well, uh, uh, you know, uh, a right-wing intellectual with, with, with very problematic views. And then in fact, you think, no, but if we can't discuss it and apply his own way of thinking, which is to agree to organize disagreements, then in fact, we can never move on. And so I, that, that's why I'm really glad that you came and that also we had, I think, a fearful discussion about what this meant. <laughs> and uh, if nobody else has got a question, you know, we actually went overboard and thank you very much. I'd like to thank you very much uh, for this and uh, for allowing us to have this discussion. Thank well, you very I much. I enjoyed it a lot. Thank you.
so next uh, next time uh, we're meeting on Friday the 24th of November and this time uh, Alan Caran from the University of Paris Saclay will come and present his new book published with Princeton University Press this year on freedom from fear an incomplete history of liberalism uh, an incredible also another incredible book in which especially I recommend the conclusion on populism uh, <laughs> that you know about it. And uh, yeah, exactly. And somebody who is also moving from perhaps a history of intellectual history into what it means for our present time. And so uh, with maturing, moving from one version to another. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.